Hi everyone, welcome to Go Local Live. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Daigle. Thanks for joining us this Wednesday afternoon. Moving a day forward so that we can accommodate Professor Jennifer Lawless at UVA after the most recent Democratic debate. Jennifer, thank you for joining us. Happy to be with you. Well, you were featured nationally today, breaking down your thoughts on last night's debate. Basically, to sum it up, it was sort of the Biden and Warren show and everyone else clamoring to get oxygen. Yeah, I mean, the New York Times actually has a really nice graphic where they show how many minutes each candidate spoke and on what different issues. Biden and Warren are at the front. And frankly, it's almost impossible for those dynamics to change because the front runners are the people that voters want to hear from. They're the people who are in the news. So the questions are going to revolve around them. And they're also going to be the people that the second tier candidates are trying to attack. So they're going to get more speaking time. And so as long as we still have 12 candidates on a stage or 10 or eight or however many we have next time around, it's almost impossible for these dynamics to change just structurally and mathematically which is really good news for Biden and Warren, but it's kind of like the end of the game for everybody else. Speaking of end of the game, uh, fewer candidates on the stage next go around. Is there, are you part of some pool as to who it's gonna be when we uh, are tuning in next time? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, but what I will say is that we saw last night, you know, Amy Klobuchar's performance, for example, was clearly an attempt to generate enough support to keep her viable so that she can be in the next debate. And so we've also got these weird circumstances where the candidates don't have to actually win or convince even 5% of voters that they should be there if they can meet this donor threshold and this public opinion poll threshold by being gutsy or by taking on Elizabeth Warren or by having a funny line. That sort of keeps them around for another month. Um, but the irony is sort of that being around for another month probably doesn't do anything for their overall campaign. It's just costing a ton of money. <laughs> and let's talk about as that field gets whittled down, and of course, when it's very much chosen, obviously, who the Democratic candidate is, um, uh, the choice of VP selection. Uh, you know, uh, let's talk about who might be sort of vying to position themselves versus, again, people, uh, players to be named at a later date. Uh, that aren't in the fold right now? Well, you know, political scientists would tell you that vice presidential selection doesn't matter at all. Um, it's unclear that it has ever generated one vote. It's unclear that it's ever made one state swing. We do know that sometimes it can up enthusiasm. Uh, when Sarah Palin was named John McCain's vice president for vice presidential candidate, for example, um, you know, a lot of conservative Republicans who were a little bit skeptical about John McCain figured, all right, she's the real deal. I'll get involved. I'll, I'll vote. But generally, it doesn't matter that much. Um, it's more about symbols. So I think everybody on that stage right now would accept that position, right? Nobody will admit to that because they'll all say that they're running, but I think they would all accept it. But there are a bunch of other candidates out there also who, who you know, decided not to run for president. So Sherrod Brown from Ohio, Stacey Abrams from Georgia. Like, we can come up with a laundry list of people who would be viable VP contenders. Um, the match is really just going to be driven by who the nominee turns out to be. It's hard to imagine that Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren would choose the same vice presidential candidate. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the elephant in the room, of course, Senator Warren ducking and weaving like a prize fighter, not answering the question as to that price tag for Medicare for all and what that would mean for taxes. Does she have to cough this up? Yes, and it's so silly. Bernie Sanders' answer was perfect, and it's the exact same answer that Elizabeth Warren could give. This is not a situation where she has to say, read my lips, no new taxes. She can say, look, your taxes are going to go up, your premiums are going to go down, and your overall cost to you is going to be lower than it is, which is exactly what Sanders said. So I, I don't know. I could, I could understand why that was her answer the first time around, but when there was pushing and pushing and pushing, it just seemed like she was evading the question. and. Part of her appeal is her authenticity and her ability to explain things in a way that people understand. So it also flies in the face of the kinds of qualities that people like about her. And you know, I would note that Pete Buttigieg was obviously the candidate who was trying to hammer her hardest on this. But the person who benefits from it isn't Pete Buttigieg, it's Joe Biden. <laughs> doing, doing Joe's work for him, basically. <laughs> and that was basically, all of the candidates last night. So anything that Bernie Sanders said that was really appealing winds up helping Warren. Anything that Klobuchar or Booker or Harris or Buttigieg said winds up helping Biden. 
Um, you know, and I, I just think that that's why these dynamics make it so complicated. And that's why a debate stage where moderators, to their credit, really were trying to ask questions and get everybody involved and, you know, engaged, doesn't do much to forward the primary field. And let's talk a little bit, both tying in the Democrats and, of course, looking at the current administration. Of course, all the Democratic contenders all on board calling for the impeachment of Donald Trump. How do the candidates differentiate themselves, again, A, when there's so much uncertainty and unknown factors, but if they're all sort of on that same page, um, what does the voter think? I mean, is that an issue that they just chalk up and say, okay, all of these candidates are on board, or is it more nuanced? I think the candidates want it to be a little bit more nuanced. We saw a little bit of jockeying last night about, well, I called for it first. Um, I don't know that that's really that compelling to the typical voter. I don't think they care. What they care about is that when the process is moving forward, that yeah. the Democrat is on board or is not on board. Uh, the other piece that I think allows for some differentiation um, is the position the candidates currently hold. So if they're in the Senate right now, it's very unlikely that the Senate, if, if impeachment hearings were held today, the Senate does not have the votes to remove Donald Trump. Um, in the House, they do. Tulsi Gabbard's the only person who could actually vote for impeachment. Uh, Joe Biden is basically the reason for the impeachment at this point. And so everybody's coming at this from different perspectives. Um, and and I, I think it's just too com just too complicated for voters. I think what they care about is, oh, these Democrats believe that Trump should not be in office, that he's running a corrupt administration, that he violated rules and laws that normal people are not allowed to violate, and that he should be held accountable. And speaking of uh, impeachment, uh, the day-to-day -day maneuverings, uh, you know, what's the latest that you are keeping eye on that could be key? Well, so... Today's news, both about Rudy Giuliani and the fact that he was definitely running a shadow State Department, um, is appalling. Um, the fact that he was so sort of ensconced in the minutia of Ukraine policy and was working so closely with so many different parties demonstrates that Donald Trump clearly knew what was going on. Um, and because there's no way that the State Department or that Mick Mulvaney or that other surrogates to the president would have allowed Giuliani to conduct business this way if the president was opposed to it. And so I think figuring out exactly what Giuliani knew and what Trump knew is going to be a big deal this week. The other thing that I would note is this is a terrible week for Mick Mulvaney. Um, you know, we've seen chiefs of staff come and go. This one seemed to be getting along with the president, and now we kind of know why. Um, you know, it might be the very thing that ultimately brings it brings him down. When we think about a lot of the people who have left the administration, you know, think back to these tell-all books or even their own exit interviews with the press, where they kind of say, well, I wasn't willing to do things that the president wanted me to do. I wasn't sure he wanted me to do this, but I stopped it anyway. You know, I took that paper off his desk. Mulvaney's not taking anything off his desk. He's not keeping any phone calls from getting through. And as a result, we're now amid impeachment hearings. Now, I'm not blaming Mulvaney for Trump's behavior, but you know, this is a perfect example of how surrounding yourself with people that are madly in love with you and your mission might not be the safest move for a president. Well, as we have gone through the litany, again, of the debate uh, wrap-up and, of course, looking at impeachment as well, anything else we need to talk about before we see you next week? I, I mean, I think the one other thing to talk about is Bernie Sanders and whether these endorsements from the squad are enough to inject a little bit new mm. of new life into the campaign. Um, you know, he handled the debate very well last night. It, he didn't seem like he was having any sort of health problems. He's gotten through this heart attack, and he not only weathered that storm, but he has some pretty high-profile political endorsements that his wing of the Democratic Party will very much appreciate. Um, whether he's able to pull back some of Elizabeth Warren's support will be interesting. But again, you know, I, I think this is a situation where Joe Biden can just sort of sit back, smile, and let them fight it out. <laughs> Uh, I believe this morning in the press rounds, Terry McAuliffe just said he did what he had to do. I mean, is, is that the bar for Joe? It is. And it's a low, low bar. Uh, but you know what? If I were Joe Biden right now, I would be pretty happy with the way that things are going. He stayed out of the fray when he's actually in the center of it. And as Bernie Sanders is possibly plotting a sort of surge, it's Elizabeth Warren who will take the hit, not Joe Biden. Well, as always, we appreciate your taking the time to Skype in. And again, Wednesday this week was fortuitous as we were able to break down last night's Democratic debate. 
And if you want to read more Jennifer Lawless, catch her on Politico today as well. So, Professor, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week. See you next week. Okay. We're going to let Jennifer Lawless go, and we're going to let you go as well. But, of course, find us on golocalprov.com. Catch us on Facebook throughout the evening. And find us back here tomorrow on Go Local Live. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel.